of each of the um, of each of the working group presentations. We have to stick pretty much in time, and I apologize for that. But um, I really want to see um, the results of each working group. But it's not only to be about presenting the results, but also to give the other work um, of the, the attendees to the other working groups to give them an overview of what is happening in those respective working groups, because they can then still decide to join that. And again, sign up in the duel, and you're free to to sign up in any work any working group, even if you have not joined it so far. So take this as a good stage to decide for future working groups. Rebecca and Thomas, you want to take the lead for the first working group. You're muted still, Rebecca. All right, now it should be okay. So I'll show a couple of slides to give you an overview. So the, the, the main content we will be discussing in our working group is um, identification and then later development of clinical outcome assessments for ARCAS, the aggregation of large cohorts, and then an implementation of a registry infrastructure. Um, so we got a good group together, but we are open for new members, of course. Um, Somehow we are missing Thomas Klocketer on this um, image. Um, he had some technical problems and dropped out uh, for, for a couple of seconds. Um, so we are open for new members. The working group leads um, as of now are uh, Matthias Sinovcic and Thomas Klocketer, but that's also something I would welcome an additional member if you're interested. In terms of governance, I'll just point out um, a few things that may be interesting to other working groups as well. So um, I think if we should discuss whether we want to use a collaboration platform like Basecamp or the Open Science um, Framework, but I think it would be advantageous to use the same platform for all working groups. And we will certainly need the input from the SCAR Global Working Group and the ARCA Global Policy Working Group um, for our working group. So that this is just a heads up for those working groups that we will um, be in touch. Um, otherwise, as a strategy, we decided to start with what uh, SCAR Global has developed already. And just to remind you, um, they have um, developed this approach with a minimal data set and an extended data set. And so this is where we started with our discussion. This is just the, the SCAR Global minimal data set and the extended data set on the right. I will. Um, go through those points where we discussed and think there needs to be more work and there are maybe discussion points that we need to talk about with other working groups. So there was one general discussion point, a valid one. Um, there is this historical separation between the SCARs and the ARCAs and it's not clear for all patients, especially for the sporadic cases, who should go into which network. Um, so that is something where we would need some guidance. And then in terms of the clinical outcome um, assessments, this, things we discussed regarding the minimal data set um, is the use of a unique identifier. We were all on board that we will need one, but I think we need to work together with the policies working group, which ones to choose, because there's a lot of consideration that needs to go into this decision. Um, we need to fine tune recording of genetic data for our class, but that's not gonna be difficult, I think. We discussed um, whether we should change the patient's global impression of change scale that um, SCAR Global is using, which is a three point scale, whether we should use a five or seven point scale instead. We also discussed something that was also discussed in SCAR Global, um, whether we should allow phone based registry visits and decided against this um, because we hope that at some points Corona will be over and we will be actually seeing our patients again. There was a lot of discussion and a strong opinion towards inclusion of the ENAS in the minimal data set for SCAR Global that is in the extended data set. Um, so this is something we would like to, um, but we would like to open this, a discussion with SCAR Global. And there was also a rather strong opinion towards inclusion of the FARS ADL in the minimal data set because we feel that um, these measures that convey relevance for patients' life are extremely important and probably underrated. And um, this is why we would like to capture those also in the minimal data set. Regarding the extended data set, um, some additional notes on the, on the FARS ADL. There was a discussion how this is actually 
applied, patient reported versus clinician reported, and there were examples for both. So we need to dig into the literature and find out what's the validation status for both modes of application. And we certainly need to standardize this. Um, we all heard the talk from Jeremy Schmarman about um, the ataxia prompts. We consider this very promising. So they may be useful, especially in a short version. They may even replace the FARCE ADL. Um, if we decide on using this, we need to decide um, whether we want to apply a formal translation mode or a, a simpler one. So that is certainly a bigger point to be discussed with SCAR Global. PHQ-9 as a measure for quality of life might also be replaced by the ataxia prompts from Jeremy if we decide to use those. There was a rather strong opinion not to use additional rating scales in addition to SARA for pragmatic reasons, um, because we need to keep the data set small. And there was a actually uniform opinion not to use the CCFS um, for reasons that standardization is difficult, that it has no relevance for daily life, and that is costly, especially if we are thinking about a global scale. So this is also something that we'd like to open discussion with SCAR Global. We did not have time to discuss a couple of important issues. So the CCAS was the leftover item from the extended data set, and we didn't touch on registries. There we will need to work with the policy working group. Um, what I would still like to announce is that we will put out a quick online survey to all of you, where we will ask you what kind of registry are you using? What's the platform? Is it GCP compliant? A few key performance parameters to get an idea of what's out there in the field um, and how could we go about um, increasing interoperability of the registries that we have in the field. And with this, I close and hope, yes, I stayed in time. Thank you very much. Very good, thank you. Uh, our next um, speaker will be Mathis Sinopsic about next generation genomics and platforms. Thank you very much, Sue. So the first decision we were having was to actually open this up to SCAR Global, make this an overarching working group, an ARCA plus SCAR Global working group. So that was the first decision we made. So this is why I put the logo at the top. And we first agreed upon the overarching goal of this working group, given that it's not a clinical working group, we have to somewhat relate it to the trade readiness platforms, Arkansas Global. However, the goal is to establish a genetic diagnosis for as many attacks as possible in order to increase the number of patients eligible to trial readiness studies and treatment studies. So we would like to maximize the number of attacks of patients receiving a genetic diagnosis, ideally for a genetic attack a condition which is already druggable now, a COP8 or MPC, or which is currently being studied and prepared for trial readiness or for druggability like RSARS, SPG7, or RFC1. How are we going to achieve those goals? First of all, the first working package is going to focus on to identify mutations in known ataxia genes. Here we have this following sub goal. We would like to increase the share of unsolved ARCA and SCAR patients receiving whole exome genome sequencing. That means we are going to produce novel exome and genome data sets. The second goal is to reanalyze existing whole exome and genome data sets of patients where no causative mutation has been found so far. And goal number three is to clarify the pathogenicity of variants of unknown significance, thus in those ARCA and SCAR genes of patients which are still unsolved, for example of RSACs or of AFG3L2 or whatsoever, to focus on those genes and here we're going to prioritize those genes which are druggable or currently being studied in natural history studies and focus on those um, of, on VAS in those genes first. The second work package will be to identify mutations in novel ataxia genes as opposed to known ataxia genes. And here we are going to establish strategies to increase the yield of identifying novel ataxia genes. Now I'm going to come how later how we're going to do this. And the ultimate goal then is to feed back the genetic information resulting out of our genetic work back into the ARC and SCAR registries so we can really then enrich those registries for genetically stratified patients which then be, we will be eligible to those trial readiness studies. So we will have to find communication methods to feed this back to the registries. 
what's the governance structure? We're going to have actually four coordinators. We're going to be a large leadership team. It's me, Stefan Sötner, Brent Vogel, Andrea Nemitz. In addition, we're going to have a steering committee with one PI presenter and all additional partners are more than welcome. They will just like be a third layer of the, of the governance structure. Like researchers, farmers, basic scientists just attending. We have the communication study uh, strategy. We are going to have an email list, which will be specifically generated for this working group. We are going to have a Zoom meeting every second month. We are going to attend, of course, the Archon's global, um, Archon's global meeting, hopefully in person next time. And we decided we would like to, to start with a base camp. So coming back to Rebecca's question for the working group number one, I think Holm, we have discussed this also from the policy group. We would like to go for base camp. That was our favorite in terms of as a collaboration platform to store files, to communicate. We discussed the consensus on how to deal with the different three different Texas NGS platforms. So we took up the um, round table discussion from last night. And that's actually a discussion which has been going on last night between Sergi, Stefan Sutner, Brent and me. And we prepared one slide, which is very text, text burdensome. The only thing, and you can read through this in, in, in later on, the only thing is for all SCAR and ARCA global attendees for now, I highlighted that in violet. What you should, should know for all for now is all the Texia global partners may choose the Texia NGS platform they prefer to use. So we will not prioritize one over the other. Use the one which you think suits your purposes best. And second, um, you are still allowed to use also another platform, for example, because this other platform has this interesting feature or for your legal reasons of your institution, or you want to run a specific project in another pipeline. So double upload is permittable. So that's a, just a nutshell. Um, you can read to this later on. So we have found an agreement on those platforms taking up the, the like session from last night. The resources which we have for our working group is already quite rich. So we have three existing international NGS consortia with large Texas databases, Prepare Genesis, Solver D, and CRGC. In addition to those consortia, we have still existing, not yet shared NGS datasets, which are, however, shareable of solved and unsolved Texas patients located at centers around the world. That's a rich resource. And the third rich resource is those cohorts of still unsolved argon scar patients which are, who are negative for common Texas genes. And this leads me to the first step of our working plan. We're going to run surveys. First of all, surveys on the, we are going to have a one pager of each of those three platforms, which will facilitate Arkansas scar global partners to make an informed decision where they should upload and to, to make a, to decide where they should upload their data sets to. And we make in this survey, we're going to ask all centers signing up for this working group, where do you have currently your NGS data sets? And in the future, where would you like to, to, to contribute it to? So this just helps us to, to mark the landscape where our NGS current data sets currently. We run an additional survey on, um, by the, on all centers signing up. How many NGS data sets do you still have, which are shareable? And this survey will also include a survey on the existing cohorts you have of still unsolved ARCA or SCAR patients who would be ready to share to produce novel NGS data sets. So this will allow us to map the landscape of, on the platforms on where the NGS data sets are, which are still shareable, and which cohorts of patients are still amendable to hold exome and hold genome sequencing. And this will be the starting step, the first step of our working plan of this is step number one, and we hope to be finished by this by the end of November. We're then going to take it from there to develop the strategies. How are we going to upload those existing data sets from around the world? And how are we going to produce novel exome and genome data sets of those still unsolved ARCA and SCAR patients? For this, we're going to develop prioritization criteria. This will be just our infrastructure homework. The next step then will be to run actual scientific projects. We're going to run a project of reanalyzing the existing data sets. We're going to focus on bus and specific genes. SACS will be one of the first genes, and this is what Nasli Bashak is also doing for the ProSpox consortium. We're going to um, form projects running new beyond the exome approaches for hunting novel genes. And then there are already new project proposals coming up in our session. For example, we would like to generate, to establish a curated database for Texas genes 
to prioritizing tri-ready taxa genes. And so this is something where we might want to ask the National Taxa Foundation for support, because that is something which is still missing in the taxa field. And we would like to put up a repository of functional assays for, for variants of unknown significance available. For example, Brand has an AOA2 functional assay available. So this helps us also to communicate and disseminate the results of our working groups to the broader public. And finally, we would like to establish ways for technical matchmaking and personal matchmaking, meaning if you have a good gene, how can you technically query that across pipelines or other persons you can ask to query it for you? And this is the last already starts. No, the projects will start in 2021. To close, we would like to be part on the collaborative series of publications which are planned for SCAR and ARCA global working groups. And we would be happy to, to contribute one um, publication by our working group. And we had Bing Wen Son on the, on, the, in the, on the attendees list. And he already signaled some interest that Cerebello might be open to, to publish a series, but his, the communication broke down. So we could discuss it in more detail, but I think Bing Wen Son, we would like to come back to you for this offer and maybe can find a way to get it working. We would like to host this dedicated section on the ARCA Global website. All three NGS and Texture platforms are going to offer hands-on training sessions to all SCAR and ARCA Global partners. So you get a training yourself. And finally, we want to intensify our outreach activities to the other Texture consortia, like Postbox or Pahan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mathis. Very nice, very ambitious. Um, and now we'll move to David uh, Mengel, who will talk about molecular biomarkers and biosampling. Yeah, hello. We had a fantastic discussion about the important topic of molecular biomarkers and biosampling. And we, we first talked about the relevance for the ACA Global Initiative and um, one specialty about our projects that we have to definitely have to make it workable in a multi setter setting. So that means that we have to really make sure that um, the protocols can be applied across all centers so that we're able to join our process and to really use this rich um, rich resources to, uh, to do interesting studies there. Uh, we, we, in terms of the framework, we just we agree that it's that it would be good to have web-based meeting every two months and one large, hopefully in the future, face-to-face -face meeting on the ACA global meeting. Um, we, we realize that there's a lot of overlap with the SCAR global working group on biomarkers, especially on SOPs, on biomarker candidates. There's some scientists working both groups so there was a strong opinion towards joining forces here, especially in the beginning when we define um, biomarker, when we define SOPs and also how we, we bring this information together so that we actually don't do things twice and to make sure that we can use a certain samples and, and things in, 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 in common projects and don't have problems there when starting this. Um, there was also a suggestion um, for interesting communication to, to, out, to the outside. Let's have a composition paper, maybe on a multi-scale system with other working groups together uh, in ARCA uh, and also then in SCAR. And then to, so to communicate this to others and also attract further people who might be interested in working together with us on biomarker um, um, sampling and also then analysis. This is already a slide that you have seen before um, from the SCO, for the SCAR um, biomass bio sample working group um, where with a minimal set of samples that we propose should be, uh, should be uh, sampled around centers. And then for others, that should be optional uh, for many reasons that we already discussed. One interesting thought that, come, that came up um, during our discussions is the importance also to recruit controls and to implement this right from the start, not only of the patients, but if you have of family members with them to include them right away into your biosampling because we all know that it's, it's really, really tricky sometimes to get controls for our studies and to implement this globally right now into, in, into our uh, protocols that we will set up. There was also the idea of also including, including not only human derived biomaterial but also maybe animal derived biomaterials as there's more and more good mice model for some, for some diseases 
and it could be interesting to join forces there as well. We came up with a preliminary working plan, and, and I will just go through the goals very quickly. First, the first goal is to have a clear cross center standardized SOPs, and uh, um, we need to we just, um, a place where all these SOPs are stored so that everybody can access them. And one very important point that came up where we need um, communication, collaboration with, um, with another um, working group, which is the working group on policies, is maybe to have a global informed consent standard. So that can be used so that we will be allowed and we'll be enabled to share samples across, um, across countries and also in, in, between different projects are not be limited there. It would be great if, they, if there could be a, a joint effort to do this. Otherwise, in terms of standardized LOPs, they will be now drafted and then um, being reviewed by the, by, by the committee members and then will be approved and then um, will be applied across the centers. We had a, we had a very uh, interesting and um, controversial discussion on why our samples should be, uh, should be stored um, centralized or in a local biobanking. And at the end, at, at the interim result, we had the idea of an optional system where people who want to give samples to, a, to, a, to let's say, a bigger place, for example, because they don't have enough resources or because they think it's a good idea, they can do this. But who wants, uh, for some reason, or maybe legal issues, can still have those samples locally stored. But then we have to make sure that these samples can be readily be, being queried and being sent to other partners if they want to do joint projects. We agree that it would be a good idea to have a centralized uh, biomaterial database so that people are able to look for mineral information or at least have access to other, to other, um, to other um, um, databases very easily without, being, without asking people actually. So to be able to get, get an overview which samples are um, available for certain projects. We realized that it's, it, it's very important to have unique identifiers, and this already came up in other discussions um, before for the patients so that we don't include samples um, from the same patients twice, maybe in some studies. We also need identifiers for follow-up visits to identify the samples. Lastly, it's very important that we need procedures um, being laid out to, to that, that define which samples are being sent out and which projects we think are the most important ones to give this very finite resource of samples to. And this will be uh, one thing we'll do here is implement a steering committee that can review those, those, those plans that will be um, laid out on a project sheet by the, by, by the researcher. And we want to define requirements who should be samples given to and who maybe not. And also here we would like to interact um, with the policies working group um, to to um, to yeah to fill, to lay down these, um, these these requirements that should be fill, that should be followed by researchers who want to have access to certain samples. That's it already. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, we're moving along nicely. We'll move next. Um, Ian Harding will be presenting the work on MRI biomarkers. Ian. Or is someone else on the committee? Uh, Sirio, will you be presenting that? Yes, I will. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, you should be able to see my screen now. So, um, these are the key points I will go through in the next couple of minutes, uh, which will summarize the uh, working group meeting we just had. Uh, we start with the, the working group goals and objectives, which uh, are going to be to build up a community to share ideas, uh, coming together as a group and discuss both acquisition and MRI data analysis uh, in order to achieve a standardized and harmonized protocols among all the senders in order to obtain a reliable and, and um, reproducible imaging biomarkers to help us in understanding the natural history of these disorders and hopefully over uh, future treatment options. And uh, lastly, we discussed about generating an imaging database, which should be accessible to all the working group uh, uh, investigators. Um, starting from the standardization and monetization of the protocols, of course, the, our discussion has been uh, done uh, in uh, tight collaboration with the Sky Global Imaging Work Package. In the light of what uh, you have seen in last days, uh, as you can see, there has been uh, some 
overlap between a lot of overlap between SCAR Global and ARCA Global, especially for the um, biomarker candidates, uh, including the MRI. Uh, for those who have missed the presentation about the SCAR Global one, this is a brief uh, overlook of what has been suggested in the past. Uh, the idea is to be inclusive, although maintaining a high standard of uh, data quality among centers. So what has been proposed is to um, have a basic protocol and an advanced protocol, both to be carried out on a 3T scanner. Uh, while going a little bit deeper in the MR data sets, uh, these are the current SCA Global recommendations, which is, again uh, include a basic protocol and an advanced protocol. The basic one includes a T1 weighted and T2 weighted for, uh, volumes for uh, volumetric analysis with uh, a range of uh, variable um, of, uh, box size uh, goes from 0.8 to 1 millimeters. And then we have the advanced protocols, which include different uh, acquisition parameters and different acquisition teams, uh, including a diffusion sensor imaging for the structure of damage and magnetic resonance spectroscopy uh, to validate um, biochemical uh, changes in different structures, which include uh, cerebellar white matter, vermis, and bones. Uh, the QSM stands for quantitative susceptibility mapping, which is a technique that has been used in the last years to evaluate the quantitatively changes in iron um, concentration in different areas of the brain, as well as resting state of MRI to evaluate functional changes. All these advanced imaging techniques uh, have a range of uh, um, suggested protocols and uh, um, acquisition parameters that have been discussed in SCAR Global in the past. Uh, so what we had in the last hour of our discussion is to embrace in the light again of the um, uh, tight collaboration with the SCAR Global Imaging Working Group, these recommendation which has already been carried out for the uh, SCARs uh, and also provide a, a recommended protocol. So using the current recommendation, which includes a range of, of uh, uh, variables and uh, uh, parameters, and also providing a recommended protocol to be uh, applied, not only in ARCA, but also in SCA global patients, uh, as well as uh, uh, including a new uh, working group, a part of a new imaging working group, which should be focused on the study of the spinal cord modifications in this condition. Uh, how are we going to do that? We are hopefully going to create uh, an imaging database which will be accessible to all the working group investigators. By doing so, uh, we are going to have a central repository uh, in order to include uh, shared images. We're going to be de identified and defaced and uh, uh, should be um, included in the concept of patients, of course, the possibility to share images. And then this will allow us to have the opportunity to uh, have application for data analysis from all the people within the uh, working group. Uh, regarding the membership, uh, I will call it uh, this group with Diane Harding and Pierre Girardi. Um, the application to the working group will circulate after this meeting via email, as well as, of course, by completing the rule that has been done. Uh, please send the email also, because we're going to track, track uh, the application, and we're going to make circulate a form which is going to include some basic information from your site, including which kind of MR scanner you have available, and the number of uh, expected number of patients you usually can uh, um, think about uh, scanning in your site. So uh, the advantages of being part of the working group uh, is, of course, being part of the community in order to share ideas, uh, share suggestions, and they have the ability uh, to this uh, shared MRI data. Um, they, we have a discussion about having a minimal requirement of patients and healthy control from each side to be enrolled in order to be part of the working group. Uh, the real number, uh, the definite number, uh, is still to be defined. That's the reason why it is very important to fill out the form that you are going to receive via email so we can have a broad idea of how many patients you have available at your site that you can uh, undergo an MRI scan. And then we're gonna create a, a different subcommittees. The first one is going to be the one that is going to work very close with the SCA Global MRI Working Group in order to um, finalize the recommended parameters as well as the recommended final protocol to be shared with the community. Uh, the second committee uh, should be the one that's going to take into account of uh, understanding how we can do a central repository for those images. And the last one is going to be uh, the one for the spinal cord uh, analysis. 
uh, are we going to do that in the future? We uh, hopefully, uh, at a certain point, we can see ourselves uh, in person. Right now, we are planning to do that uh, via virtual meeting in a platform on the side. In the first year, we're going to do that every three months in order to um, help the group in starting up and close the uh, recommended protocol recommendations. And then, uh, hopefully, doing that uh, every six months. Of course, uh, we're going to be available uh, via direct communication via email in the email account. You can here and that's it thank you very much Sirio um, we will now move on Adam Vogel will you be presenting for um, digital motor biomarkers I will thank you uh, good day everybody see my screen good um, we had a, uh, a fruitful discussion over the last couple of hours um, on digital biomarkers or digital clinical markers, I should say, rather than biomarkers. Uh, the goal of our group is to um, establish uh, standards for digital motor and digital assessments uh, across protocols. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging task harmonizing this across centers, uh, given that every corner you turn, there's a new company developing a new technology and uh, looking to uh, use that in, in various contexts, but we, we focused on trying to establish a set of domains that we thought would be appropriate um, in, in this context. Uh, and we came to the conclusion that uh, speech fine motor, uh, gait stance, and there's also ocular motor uh, are the key domains for um, this digital approach. Um, looking at developing a minimal uh, data set uh, or protocol that, that fits across sites was one of the focus that we had. Uh, and then um, given that the, there's a the huge amount of data that's produced in that context, uh, some pipelines for, for analysis. Uh, we were looking to set up, I might skip that slide, uh, the goals. And um, one of them is, uh, becoming trial ready from a context of digital assessments. If uh, initial discussions were looking at whether or not um, the methods could be used to assist differential diagnosis, for example, or disease severity as a whole, but um, what we're looking at is measuring um, change over time given the objectivity of the, the assessments that we have uh, to play with. There was discussion around the mode of assessment, whether or not it's uh, we're looking at continuous monitoring versus daily or intermittent monitoring in the home um, versus clinic assessment. And um, given the expertise within our group, we're looking to take on a number of these challenges uh, and utilize the, the resources within each site uh, to look at some comparisons uh, once we've established a protocol itself. Uh, some of the challenges that we're facing relate to the different technologies that are available uh, and the expense that comes with some of them. <clears throat> We're really interested in uh, securing some industry support for things like uh, equipment purchase, but initially we're gonna start with uh, some case use examples and, and demonstrate the capacity of different sites to harmonize protocols um, across different uh, geographical regions. So uh, we have established a working group. Um, we've established the domains that we're interested in, those, those five that I mentioned before. Uh, within our group, we hold expertise across those. And um, when we're within that group, we're setting up uh, some individuals who are gonna lead particular domains. What we're looking at is <clears throat> establishing a core set of metrics that we can apply for movement, for example, that we know have um, adequate reliability and stability and sensitivity to change and beginning with them and, uh, and then expanding out once we've established uh, the, the viability of that approach. There were some discussions around the actual data itself. So you can appreciate if you're using a, a, a um, technology that, that develops that um, produces data, whether or not um, members of the committee have access to the raw data itself. And there was um, 
generous and open discussion around how uh, uh, companies like APDM, which are a movement assessment company, uh, do collect raw data and they're happy to share that uh, within that context. And the same applies to speech where people record their speech and anyone can get access to that data rather than locking it down in, in any particular proprietary algorithms or, um, or systems that don't share. So uh, <clears throat> our working plan is we, we've established the domains that we're, we're interested in. We are looking to uh, liaise with the um, clinical group because we need to establish what our lines of reference are from in terms of the, the clinical assessments. So whether or not we're um, creating alliances with things like SARA or ICARS or, or any of sort of uh, clinical assessments in that regard. Um, we haven't fully established exactly what sensors we're going to use because this is an ongoing uh, debate, but this is um, what it looks like we're going to do is utilize the resources from each site and then start to explore the, the viability of um, adopting similar approaches across them. Uh, <clears throat> we're taking a modular approach to how we are um, utilizing the resources of each site. So not everyone has an APDM system, for example, but those that do can contribute in that way. And if other people are using something like QMOTA or um, their own um, their own site specific devices, then we can utilize those and then work around the, the limitations for them. This is, uh, I think we've established a similar sort of line of communication to, to the other groups in that we're having, um, we've got mail outs. Uh, we're also interacting with, we're looking to interact with potential other groups that are involved in technology and assessment of neurological function. Um, I should have established early on that we're, we're interested in um, adopting an approach that covers both SCAR Global and ARCA Global, because I don't think that there is an equivalent of digital markers for SCAR Global. Um, and the members in our group seem to also cover all of the dominant inherited disorders as well. Um, this is all housekeeping, and I don't think we need to go through it, but uh, regular updates, our next meeting is in December, and uh, obviously following up with the, low, the global meetings as well, and connecting in with the um, PROs and, and clinical outcome measure groups as well. I'm not going to cover that one. And um, I'm not going to cover that one, but this is effectively uh, highlighting the, the modular approach that we're going through. So looking at um, the flash talk that Andreas did yesterday, I think it was, where we are able to pick and choose some of the domains that we're particularly interested in and those uh, covered by each site. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, we're moving, this is moving along nicely. Um, we now have um, model systems and preclinical trials. Bernard Ra will be presenting that. Hi, everyone. Um, so we had a, we were nine. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, that um, I adapted our agenda to, to bring back to you some, some conclusions. Uh, we were nine, uh, uh, four from ARCAs, if you want, uh, two from two to three from SCAs and one from episodic ataxia. So I think the, the first question is, was whether this group, uh, whether this group should be uh, ARCA, uh, alone type of group. And I think the, the impression of everyone is that it makes more sense that uh, we uh, expand to include people who uh, would have a wide scope of interest in taxes in general, whatever the mode of transmission. Uh, and, and also a strong, uh, I think, universal agreement that there's a purpose for this type of group. And we'll discuss that as I go down with some of the objectives and, and that, could be, uh, that could be broadened and, and, and worked on in the next uh, months, two years. So, so yes, the wide scope group with uh, models from, from uh, human material to iPSCs to animal models, um, 
and the yes to uh, a broad adaptive group. So we, we discussed uh, a few other, uh, many other items, and I've tried to summarize them in, in uh, the more specific deliverables. Um, <clears throat> So I think the, the, when Mattis launched this idea, the, what was more obvious to everyone is that this would be a group where people could share standard operating procedures to assess different animals. And, and uh, maybe with time, those, those procedures would be used by many and even be, become reference procedures. So everyone thought that this was a good idea and should continue. Uh, I think already at that point of the discussion, people uh, uh, became very, um, enthusiastic about the idea that much of that work is done by some of our trainees and very strong technical experts in our groups. And so really they have to be part of the group also. And if it's going to be a working group, it has to be around, centered around work and sharing work experience. And that, as you will see, colors a little bit what we would like to do uh, with the group. <clears throat> the question of <clears throat> Sorry, the question of preclinical trial. Everyone was uh, in favor of open discussions and using the group as a bouncing board. And clearly, uh, everyone thought that the other people of the group should learn that, that someone's working on a, a candidate compound that maybe uh, would be uh, of use in models uh, other than the one that the individual are using at that time. And so, in fact, the idea that the group would be um, a, a forum where people would realize that in fact people are working on other things that are not yet published that could be of interest to them. I think that could prompt uh, collaborations and, and interesting work. Related to that, it was the strong message that basic scientists uh, and most of the people who attend were basic scientists realized that the clinical framework of, of motor transmission and system affected and so forth when it comes to models and there's going to be so much overlap that we can, everyone can, in the models environment, can learn from the experience of, of another working on another gene-related uh, pathology. We discussed the idea of sharing large data set, and I think uh, that's important for the, for the patient organization. We, we, one of the challenges from the start and why I think some of the organizations supported the, the development of ARCA Global was the idea that many of the patients and families knocking at their door saying, we're forgotten were not being remembered by the association. So what, how can you as association help develop increased interest? So uh, large data sharing is, 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 is one of the places where this issue became important and we'll discuss it later. So the idea is, though it's difficult to think that we cannot share, we can share unpublished material. I think around projects, still this will happen. And hopefully, as we have now, some projects are intrinsic to ARCA Global, uh, Postfax being the, the, the leading one. These projects will probably bring other people in its gravitational force that will use some of the data uh, generated. And then maybe that approach will allow other projects to be developed on rare forms that are neglected. Uh, but Though, despite these difficulties, maybe some of those projects will lead to uh, experience of sharing that will lead to other sharing experience around rare ar archives and therefore meet the, the mandate of developing research on many of the less studied ones. So if we go to uh, the network, and I think it's an important discussion, maybe at, at the end some people can add more uh, uh, and as we, go, we, we think about this. So the, the general impression from the group was we think that the network will develop if we focus very much on project-oriented uh, questions. So in, in a way, it's more, let's share our experience on different models, different disease. So in that sense, the rare form could benefit, a researcher working on a rare form could benefit from before developing its model or trying to characterize the model from the experience of many others and bring together around our meeting more the technical challenges and experience of its people to allow some projects to move faster uh, and not being in a, in a vacuum somewhere, but really saying, well, I, through that group, I, I made contacts that would allow me to really uh, jump some hurdles that I would have difficulty doing locally and, and talking to people. So I think that will, that will help. And I think that was very strong. And, and we thought that, uh, in fact, that should influence the nature of the meetings, which I will finish on. The other thing is we thought, again, related to the network, is that the network has to expand and has to bring people who have a lot of extensive experience on, on models 
uh, from the attacks of field uh, broadly defined, including field rights, including uh, the SCAs. And I think it, what we've decided and is, is, is more to uh, try to do that in a kind of personal way. So work out a, a, a more descriptive term of what the network is and, and what, what's its purpose and try to get other people, particularly the ones that are more associated with the SCAs and, and the episodic attacks uh, to, to join uh, this, this model. One important thing, and I think that's where the, 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 the uh, patient organization may be able to help us is because of those, the, those hundreds of different conditions, maybe uh, researchers would benefit from some form of inventory. I'm not talking about a repository. I'm talking about an inventory of, of fibroblast lines that are available. Many conditions, this has been happening in AF and others. And, that's a place where maybe there is a way for organizations to uh, encourage uh, contact between some patients and families to certain units that could allow to make fibroblast lines in particular available to others. And that may include other material like some of us who, who do collect autopsy material and so forth. Rare means that it's, it's distributed widely and, and not always known. So maybe this, this model uh, um, uh, work uh, group could be a, a fulcrum to bring uh, a visibility to those resources or this material that are lying about and, and not known because they just they're not they haven't been inventoried like with the AF or for Duchenne or for other uh, more common muscular dystrophies, for example. So at this point, the, the suggestion is to try to get a kind of two levels of membership to our activities. One is from the people who already uh, showed interest is to try to build a list of, of trainees, including technical people in labs who would could endorse or uh, join the, the, the work group. And in fact, use this workforce and some of the senior and more active postdocs to try to organize scientific oriented activities. So to that would bring forward more in the from a laboratory uh, seminar, some of the research that's being done to foster interest, foster exchange, foster uh, um, sharing of experience that could bring projects to fruition uh, faster. And, and so that was the idea. I, we don't know, in fact, we haven't agreed on, on the frequency we thought of January as a first and, and we'll see. We, one other idea that was pushed by me and based on some of the comments was the idea that we, could, we should do more uh, organized pathology. We can even do like, in, we can imagine mice pathology rounds almost on some of the mice models to try to see because they're it's the same pathways that are attached, the same cells. So maybe we can, this, this uh, network, this work group could become a, a, a fulcrum for pathological expertise on the different models related to ataxia. And IPS being so fashionable and so, uh, so much in development in many of the laboratories that everyone thinks they need to know more. So maybe that could be one of the themes of one of the meetings is use one of the groups that are more active in that field to try to bring forward, uh, share their experience and see how other groups that are contemplating but are not yet doing it, uh, decide whether they want to uh, get involved in, in including an IPSC component to their work. The important issue also was the, the importance of, of basic scientists and the organization of the next ARCA and SCA Global. I think the, the, the boards above will decide how this is done, but clearly uh, uh, the, 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 the will and the desire was to ensure that we, there will be a, a model work group type of focus meeting uh, that maybe will be a little bit different in, in, in its way of presenting which will maybe reflect the desire that it's more work oriented rather than just impressing people on what has been uh, developed. So maybe it's longer talks, maybe it's, there's something that would make it more a, a work group than simply a pure scientific animation activity. So that's something that I hope the people above uh, will, will try to consider in planning the next meetings. We haven't extensively decided on leadership because we, we have uh, three uh, people who were flagged initially who worked closely with the two begin group. Uh, we want to see what, what uh, the above leadership wants us to define as, as a leadership. Uh, we, at, at this point, it's more trying to define who we want to partake. We only have nine people this time. It's a small group. So how do we 
and see the future of recruitment and at the same time in parallel working at the leadership. I think the three people who will flag a chair of the meeting are, are willing at this point to continue to contribute to define the leadership of their group and hopefully the trainees uh, will uh, and, 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 and highly technically trained people in our groups will help in, the, in at least the organization if not the, the leadership of the, of the group but also the organization of the very work-related uh, activities. So that's what I wanted to share with you uh, today. All right, thank you very much, Bernard. Um, we'll now move to the policies and patient organization engagement with Holm Grassner. And now if you stop sharing, I could share my screen. Sorry for that, yeah. Sorry. So we had a very nice discussion um, and had um, representatives from patient organization, from industry, um, um, clinicians um, um, and um, admin persons. And um, um, we um, um, decided on the um, facilitators um, of the um, um, policy working group, which um, um, Julie Greenfield and Sue Hagen and, and myself. Uh, we also discussed the relation with the existing Sky Global Working Group and um, proposed to merge the working groups because um, uh, the topics being covered uh, by both working groups um, are the same. Uh, third, we discussed goals um, and um, the first um, topic there, we discussed um, were membership criteria. Really, well, we didn't really discuss how the membership criteria um, should um, look like, but um, we discussed um, to whom a membership criteria um, should apply. And um, we uh, think that um, um, we should um, have um, members um, from um, academia, so healthcare professionals and researchers, and those are individuals. And that's in line with the, um, um, with the um, 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 statements I, I discussed um, on, on Monday. But also, uh, we thought that um, it's important to have um, industry and patient groups as members on board. And uh, for um, industry and patient groups, um, it would then be um, representatives um, of um, organizations. Um, a second, um, we discussed um, what um, would be the drivers um, of um, um, ARCA and, and SCAR Global then. And we really thought that in addition to the working groups and also in addition to the um, projects, I think which we will come um, to um, um, after this um, session at least um, 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 shortly, uh, that um, uh, services provided um, by the um, entire group um, should be defined and um, discussed. And these services um, in particular um, provided to industry might include um, the um, clinical trial site registry which you might know from the Tweet m and Consortium, which is basically a registry of the uh, trial infrastructure, which is established um, on, on site. So this is, um, was initially um, being uh, set up uh, for uh, neuromuscular groups, but uh, in the uh, neuromics project and um, Thomas, uh, Mattis and Rebecca, I think um, we call that, uh, we adapted uh, the clinical trial tri tri site registry also to uh, rare neurodegenerative diseases. So that's um, um, all in place um, to, uh, to be used for, uh, for Texas sites. Um, second um, service we discussed was um, the establishment of a global patient advisory group. So um, not to have um, um, just groups um, all over the world um, as it being member, but also to uh, coordinate um, the advice given uh, by the patient groups um, to, to, in particular, to industry. Um, third, uh, and that's also coming from um, Twitter NMD, um, we discussed them um, having a therapy advisory committee um, and um, um, uh, giving information um, on um, uh, numbers of patients being seen um, at uh, the different sites. Um, in, in um, particular, um, um, regarding um, uh, genotype um, and um, further information relevant for trials. And we, we dis discussed these services in particular also um, to um, have the opportunity to um, set up um, services which can provide an income for um, um, 
uh, for the attacks of global initiatives because we thought that's um, important to um, um, have a sustainable um, infrastructure um, to um, um, to um, um, coordinate um, um, the attacks of global initiative. Um, the operations and communicating means we're going to use is mailing lists. Um, so that's this is being set up for Sky Global already and needs expansion to uh, the additional members. We're going to use uh, meetings and the cloud for documents. Um, and um, I agree with with Mattis. We should um, uh, should con consent on on one um, cloud service to be used um, for all the working groups. And the, the first milestones and the, the first thing we really think um, we, we should um, now focus on uh, are the membership criteria because that's the basis for anything. Um, and in order to achieve that, um, we will be um, drafting a first um, set of criteria by end of November uh, through the facilitators. So um, Sue, um, Julie and me, we will be organizing a meeting of the working group by end of the year. Um, to discuss um, the draft and um, um, conclude um, on the uh, proposal to the steering committee. And um, hopefully, um, if um, our um, membership could, um, can convince the uh, steering committee, uh, we will have um, membership clear in place by end of January um, 2021. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Holm. Um, I'm, I'm going to call on Mathis. Uh, to add a few more things to um, our working group results. Yes, thank you, Sue. There were just just the um, to more or less housekeeping remarks. One is, could we kindly ask all presenters of the working group leads, which I've just shared the PowerPoint, to send this PowerPoint to Birte Zurich. This will help us to keep track on the what was promised by the working groups and, and also to, to, to coordinate this. And because just watching the recordings will be much harder than checking through it through the PowerPoint. So we would be happy if all working group leads sent the PowerPoint to build it. That was point number one. The point number two is we forgot one poll, very important poll. So, and we were supposed to ask it at the beginning of this session. So um, this poll, can we have the poll up please, Birte? And just imagine you were at the beginning of the session rather than at the end of the session. No, that is, no, that's not the one. It's the wrong poll, Verde. Sorry. If we cannot have it, then we would skip it. But it would be one more chance. It would have been an interesting poll because it asked you about what do you like more of a virtual rather than a face-to-face -face meeting. And I think those are lessons to be learned by now and we'll be happy to, to give yet your feedback on this. So if you can still find the poll. If not, we not too bad because then this brings us, we will just leave it. And I think you can, we close your session or is there anything yes, you would like yes. to say? Yes, so I wanna say thank you to all of the working group leaders, all of the, work. oh, here we have our poll, but um, should we go ahead and, is this the one? Let's yeah. fill this up. And again, just imagine that was at the beginning of this session rather than at the end. So to wrap this poll up, so most were even in their breaks, rather than enjoying your breaks, they were still having discussions. The most asset, the highest asset of doing virtual conferences rather than face-to-face is no spending time on traveling, reduced cost for participation, easier to attend and skip sessions. So I don't think anybody was skipping sessions. I don't think this will take place. So better this missing one thing, the, the less CO2. So it's ecologically much more friendly, much more greener than what we're doing. We should have put this on the poll. And the third one is um, which um, working group did you attend? And it was the number two and number seven were the ones which were attended the most out of the working groups. So again, 
question. Don't forget to sign up in the poll. We already have 41 people signing up in the poll for the working groups. And this shows that this is really going to be one of the drivers of ARCA and SCAR Global. With this, I would like to hand over to uh, Thomas um, Kolokete, who would like um, to start the, um, the wrap-up session, um, which Thomas and me are going to, to share. Sorry, that's wrong. Sorry. Thomas, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I have no slides. Uh, I will try to do it orally and, and try uh, to give a short summary uh, resume of uh, the meeting. First, most important, my perception was this was really an excellent and fruitful meeting. Um, and uh, a number of things really went very well first. All the technical things went extremely smoothly. And I must say that I could have never imagined uh, maybe one year ago that we would be ever able to run such a meeting uh, with lectures, with discussions, with working groups on a virtual uh, format. So this is really great. And uh, it shows which technical uh, opportunities we have today, but that it went so smoothly is uh, mainly due to the uh, excellent preparation by the uh, people in Tübingen, and uh, I specifically uh, wish uh, to thank Bilte and Holm, but also the entire team in Tübingen. So this was really great uh, to organize that in this uh, way. Nevertheless, Thomas, but Thomas, maybe we can just unmute all the panelists can unmute their microphone and give an applause to Bilte and Holm and the IT help desk team, which was Sanja Hermanns, Cornelia Elwanger, Birte, and I probably, Annemarie Post, I probably forgot three or four persons. So thanks to the IT team, that was a lot of work. Yeah, the large team. Sorry, Thomas. Um, okay, nevertheless, um, um, I think we do not need a poll uh, to ask people whether we prefer uh, face to face or a, a virtual meeting. I think the virtual meeting uh, will be great for the working groups to get uh, things going to make further progress. But there is no question, for me at least, there's absolutely no question uh, that uh, at least one spring or every second year a face-to-face -face meeting, despite traveling and, and uh, technology uh, and all these things, nevertheless, we need uh, these face-to-face -face meetings because uh, despite of all coffee room meetings and whatever uh, the interaction uh, in this uh, virtual uh, environment is, is not optimal uh, and we need the personal contacts uh, this is really a community uh, we have many friends who want to be friends who want to sit together with a beer or coffee and uh, this was unfortunately not possible. So uh, I think no question as soon as it will be possible again, uh, we will have uh, the face-to-face -face meetings. Um, so this was the, the just organizational technical aspect, but uh, what is more important, uh, the content uh, of the meeting, the scientific quality uh, that was also great really outstanding, excellent, and I was particularly impressed uh, by the flash talks. I think they uh, had high, highest scientific quality there. We had the new findings uh, which lead into the future, and these were mainly young investigators, and uh, this is also a great experience that there's a new generation of ataxia investigators, and uh, this makes me very optimistic. Uh, for the future. I have to apologize to all those who also uh, submitted abstracts and who were not uh, selected for a flash talk. Uh, and unfortunately in this, uh, this is also a disadvantage of uh, this uh, meeting format. We were not able, it was also a question of time, we were not able to give uh, them a platform, a forum uh, there were also very important 
uh, findings, uh, contributions, I, and I would again ask everybody to look at the conference brochure and, and uh, read uh, the abstracts and in any future uh, uh, meeting, whether it's virtual or if we hopefully can back, uh, go back uh, to face-to-face to -face meetings, uh, we will then again give all abstract submitters the opportunity to present an e-poster or a flash talk, maybe a longer flash talk uh, sections. Uh, so the scientific uh, content and quality was really uh, uh, high and uh, what is also extremely important uh, that uh, this meeting had clear results, we have clear perspectives uh, for the future and uh, Mattis uh, will um, continue after my words uh, giving a uh, uh, to-do list um, and uh, so um, there will be closer collaboration in the working groups, uh, but uh, we will also uh, launch uh, new projects. And uh, this is also something that makes me very optimistic for the future. A final remark, uh, in when you remember back to the Monday to my very first uh, works, the first uh, uh, slide that I had, uh, there I mentioned the fragmentation of uh, the field um, and uh, what um, these global uh, initiatives have the goal to overcome this fragmentation and maybe one important uh, step uh, that we more or less already decided during this uh, meeting but we have to further discuss that and to, to have formal decisions is uh, that we uh, do not want a further fragmentation of the field in an SCAR field, in an ARCA field. My impression is that the Free Dikes community is already well organized, is also in the most important, biggest, greatest country in the in US. There are uh, different patient organizations. I think this is something one has to accept if one is realistic. Uh, but um, when we uh, just look at all other ataxias, uh, I think we should not get further divided. And I think uh, this is a very good development uh, that uh, SCAR Global and, and ARCA Global will go together. It does not need to be a merge, uh, but alignment. Uh, and I think uh, in the policy working group and in, in the steering committee, um, we will further work on that to align that work as much as possible. There's such a lot of overlap that uh, almost in most countries, the same patient organizations uh, and uh, the community of researchers is almost the same. Uh, most uh, investigators are both interested in the dominant ataxias and the recessive ataxias. So uh, I think it's, it's a clear perspective to bring uh, both initiatives together. So with that, uh, I would uh, again uh, thank uh, everybody. I already uh, uh, expressed my thanks to the organizers. I would but also extend that to all presenters uh, and uh, the entire audience. And uh, I can always check uh, the numbers and it's still impressive how many are still there, although today was a very specific day with working groups for ARCA and not the uh, uh, proper Congress. So um, with that, I would like to hand over uh, to uh, Mattis, who will uh, give you a list of to-dos and what you have to do. Thank you, Thomas. Before doing so, so two remarks. One remark is because that is just coming up in the chats in the last discussion is, why are we saying we are aligning our current SCAR Global rather than merging it? And there are two main arguments for this. Argument number one being the recessive attacks so far are always a little bit, um, in general, we say Stiefkin. They're, they're children not taken care of very well. And, one worry, one concern is if we merge it all together now, especially the repeat scars are so becoming so powerful with, with treatment on the horizon, the recessive attacks will once again be put back to the edge. So 
I think we will have to strengthen the voice of the recessive in Texas and they have to have a proper voice in itself. That's argument number one. Argument number two is we hope that for the recessive in Texas, we're going to follow the repeat scars very soon with treatments on the horizon, maybe not now, but maybe in two to three years. And for that, we may need to have special preparations and we will have differentiation in the field also in recessive in Texas. And those two arguments are arguments for aligning alpha global discography with but not merging it. So that was just to close that. Before charging you with the next steps to do is we would like just to give one more honor to those um, people who have received the Flash Talk Prize. Four people, people have received 100 euro Amazon um, 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 budget. And Bertie, if you could put up the graphic. And I think we announced two of them already. I don't know actually if we announced all four of them. So just to make sure that we haven't lost them. But do you want to present the four to yourself? Oh, so Conga, oh, that was quick. <laughs> I'm not that quick, even though I speak fast. Um, so Andreas Trasche, Celeste Stewart, Janet Hübner-Schmidt, and Jennifer Faber, congratulations to all four of you. Um, I think once again, please let's applause them once again. <laughs> so congratulations to 100 euro and um, really a great work. And again, nice. They, those were both dominant text and recessive talks. So thanks for that. Now. That was enough with the nice words. Now we have to get to our work. And what are the next steps we should do, you should do? You are going to receive an email in the next days, which is going to be sent to all the Texas Global attendees, just so to all of you. And this email will include the following action points. It first, a feedback questionnaire on this conference. And please take this seriously. It will help us to improve the future conferences. Second, a link for the ARCA Global Working Group participation. So again, the doodle, which you might already have seen in the chat, but just to make sure you don't miss it. Thirdly, a link to the Sarah training tool developed by Thomas Kolokhetter's team. Fourth, a link to the Atexa Global Cloud um, with, as a central document storage system. And we're trying to, to, to identify the best system working for this. And finally, uh, the project sheet template for your suggestions for projects which you would like to run on SCAR and ARCA um, global infrastructure. And here I'm coming back to my very first or one of my first slides on Monday, because I would like to give an update to the slides which you have already seen before. We updated the timelines and the, um, um, the, the part of correspondence, because many of you said the timelines were too short. So, if you have a, would like to run a project for ARCA or SCAR infrastructure, submit a project template until November 20th, so this is one month from now, and please send it not to Emily Cutting, as announced earlier, but to the email of, of the Texas Global Initiative, which you see up there. Again, those projects will be checked and coordinated by the ARCA and SCAR Global Steering Committee. That has not changed. That will now be done in December. The conference, which will help to inform all participants and to discuss the content and to do a brokerage of those projects, which we would like to um, invite all of you, will then take place hopefully in January 21. And this will be a half or full day conference where we decide upon these projects. What is at stake here? Once again, it's not that we have funding. We are no funding organization. It's about which projects should be endorsed by the respective architecture global platforms. Endorsement meaning receive full infrastructure support in terms of contact list, email list, standards, SOPs, discussion platforms, registry access, and so on. So that was just an updating in terms of the timelines and the, where to send the project template to, which you're going to receive in that email. So that's one package of action points. The second package of action points is Please sign up and keep up the good work of the working groups, both in SCAR Global and ARCA Global. And we have seen, as Sue has pointed out, some of our working groups um, agendas were quite ambitious, which is good. So we now really just have to implement them and realize them. So keep up the work, sign up and keep up the working group work. And again, prepare project proposals and submit them until November 20th. 
Those two components will be two of the main drivers of our initiatives, the working groups and the projects. This is what will only at the very end make our platforms decide whether this is going to be a success or not. And finally, the next meetings, um, as I just said, we are going to have a Texas Global project-based meeting in January 21. And then another real general SCAR, SCAR and ARCA Global meeting, which we envision to be a two-day meeting, probably late in 21. But this we have to, we would like to have it in person, maybe hopefully as a satellite meeting to one of the other international meetings, or if COVID does not permit, still another virtual meeting. But let's hope that we can have a face-to-face -face meeting as a satellite meeting in late 21. With this, I would like again to thank Bill and Tom. We have done this, but especially I would like to thank all of you. Um, sitting three days in front of a computer, in front of a screen for eight hours until late at night, that is really, I found it quite laborsome. So thanks of all for sticking with us and really doing this creative work, even at the end of the conference, thinking about the working groups coming up with an agenda that was so much creativity. Thanks for your input and thanks for sticking with us. And we are looking forward to Thomas and me to the next years to work together with you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>